Hello, YouTubers. This is another session in our series of podcasts where I get to chat with inspiring people, some very famous and uh, popular figures in the tech industry that, you know, have been engaged or key personnel into creating some of the greatest technologies that we use today to, today to build some of the greatest systems. Today, I'm joined by a person that I really, really admire, a person that I really like to hang out with. He's, his name is Mads Torgerson. Am I saying the name right, Mads? Is that right, Torgerson? That is the perfect American way of saying it, yes. <laughs> okay, so what's what's that? So you're originally from Finland, is that right? Denmark. 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 Danish. Okay, so what's the Denmark, the Danish way to say your last name? Torgerson. Torgerson. Say it again. Torgerson. Torgerson. No, you oh, can't that, even hear the G. It's not coming. <laughs> no, no. This, this is why I don't even try because Danish is actually, there's been a lot of research on Danish. I'm immediately going off on a tangent here. Yeah, Recently please go ahead. Mm -hmm. About how it's objectively harder to learn and harder to pronounce uh, than almost any other language on the planet. So, um, uh, well, what I've long suspected has now been scientifically proven that it's just a, yeah. <laughs> so I'll tell you this much though. While while your native tongue, your your native language might be a little bit harder, you are a big part and one of the people that actually, you know, contributed heavily and created the C sharp programming language, which is basically some of the easiest, simplest programming languages that I've used. I come from Scala background. I know you've done a lot with Java yourself, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Mm -hmm. It just works. It's just poetry. It just flows when you're trying to represent an idea, especially with the new ideas like pattern matching and, you know, being able to check for null real quick on the fly. The All of these little things that are happening. Discard. I love the discard, Mads. I love it. You know, I feel like I feel like I'm writing in Scala again in a little bit, you know, just a tiny bit, you know, and it's I really appreciate that. But enough you know just so for the people watching if you're using c sharp mads right here you know he drives you know some of the biggest features in this language he's been day there from day one with anders heilsberg and everybody else you know he's been contributing heavily and he's his main job the last time i i was hanging out with mads he basically said i learn from everybody i try to see all the programming languages that are out there and i try to find the best thing that i can put in c sharp Welcome, Mads. How are you doing today, sir? <laughs> Thank you. Well, after that introduction, I'm really doing great. <laughs> <laughs> should I should I should I be doing your LinkedIn kind of introduction like that? <laughs> if you can get work, if you can get working on my tombstone, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, after a long, <laughs> long time, there's still a lot of cool things that we want to do in C Sharp. And I yeah, really yeah, would I'm... love to have you be around for a very long time, sir. You're more than just the programming language. You're actually a, a decent and a nice human being, even on a personal level. And you guys will see, like, you don't know the guy yet. You haven't talked, you haven't seen, like, a lot of people, just like I was telling Mads, you know, a lot of people talk to Mads about programming languages, technology. Today, we're going to talk about Mads, you know, and Mads alone. So, Mads, tell us a little bit about yourself. Where are you from? You know, where you grew up, your journey to come all the way over here to America and start contributing some of the biggest, greatest languages in the history of man. Tell us all about that. All right. <laughs> Good. Let's see. I'm, uh, well, from Denmark, um, a little, the the second largest city in Denmark called Aarhus. Okay. Let, and, let me share the screen here because here in America we're not geography buffs. I was just telling, uh, I was just telling um, what's it, uh, David Fowler the other day. You know, I was telling him where, where is where is Barbados? I want to know. So okay, let's go, let's go, Matt. Is that okay with you? If I type in Denmark, of course, then, yeah. yeah, okay. Okay, Denmark. It's gonna end up being a restaurant here in Seattle or something. You'll <laughs> see. Just wait. We're, <laughs> okay, so here we're it is. Denmark Street in London. Oh, there we are. Okay. Okay. That big uh, part that's attached to Germany. That's uh, called Jutland. And, oh, okay. And it has sort of like a nose pointing to the right. Okay. This. Oh, all the way closer here. Am I going in the right direction? Uh, yeah. If you go a little north from there. North. Okay. And then you can further, uh, further, further. Okay. Further. <laughs> okay. Wow. Wow. We're getting colder. Stop, stop, stop. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, this is hard because there's a little lag on the uh, on the video. But um, okay. that city in the uh, lower right corner, right under the nose there, that is Oost. That is where I'm from. 
Oh, nice. Okay. Okay. All right. Nice. And how was life in there? How did, you know, you grew up in there, you lived your whole life in that city? I, I lived in, uh, until I moved to the United States, I lived my life in that city or like surrounding cities or, or okay. towns. It's been it, always been in that area. Okay. Um, and, and you went to college there and just your whole life. W were you were you always dreaming to be a software engineer? Did it just click with you oh, when you were young? Okay. okay. I wasn't always dreaming about it. I was always a little interested in programming. Um, okay. I am, my, my dad, um, as a computer scientist too, uh, he okay. he tried out a couple of different things, but ended up uh, getting a computer science degree from Aarhus University. Okay, and so I was always, and he had that kind of mindset, that kind of logic, mm -hmm. um, system design, always logical if else yeah. statements. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I'm, I'm saying it in the past tense, but he still does, uh, and he. Um, uh, and he he tried his best not to influence me. He's like, I don't, I don't want to. I want you to live your life. Be yeah, your live own. your own life. Find, have, yeah. find your own interests, you know. And he, so yeah. he really tried his best to not overexpose me to it, but all in vain, you know. And at the end of the day, um, <laughs> I, you know, I have, I had, haven't had many uh, interests other than programming. I was never kind of like just about that, but. Yeah. Um, so it wasn't like a, a slam dunk choice for me, but it, but in the end, after after um, a gap year, a lot of yeah. after high school, it was like yeah. okay, I do want to do computer science, and then try to combine it with some other stuff that uh, that complements it a little bit. When I went to university, so so what other interests did, did what other things did you like to do? You know what um, what was your thing? You know, go ahead. Mm -hmm. I was quite into music i like playing music i that kind of fell by the wayside a little like i'm sure i could dust it off at some point again but <laughs> right. uh i almost you know considered making it a career nice. um but i wasn't good enough at it so it would have to be more like as a music teacher or something mm -hmm. um I, I don't think i could have been a professional musician um i um i enjoyed sort of like things in the sociological, psychological, anthropological sphere as well. Nice. And they considered things like ethnography or anthropology. I ended nice. up taking a, a minor in uh, religion. Um, nice. Oh, yeah, I remember that. I remember sort of like, it, yeah, combines yeah. a lot of those different things and, uh, you know, allow you to to uh, hit many birds with one stone. So, uh, so I, I did that, yeah. I, I I I do notice that you know there is somewhat a correlation between musical notes and programming in a way, right? Is this what was? I mean, at a time you're not thinking programming, but our minds, you know, get attracted to certain patterns, certain logical structures that makes us say, "Oh, that makes sense to me," right? You know, one plus one equals two. Okay, this is this is what these musical notes is. Is this what it was? Or are you more open to more like vague vagueness? Like there is a, like you talked about religion a little bit, right? You know, there is metaphysical, right? Things that you can't necessarily prove, you know, things that are not exactly one plus one equal two. Mm -hmm. Is this, are you like in both sides, you know, you like them, you know, kind of to understand things in a more systematic, predictive, predictive way, but also at the same time think that are more like, kind of not very certain things are open for interpretation I, mm -hmm. I definitely am more on the scientific side of the spectrum uh -huh. i'm not uh -huh. personally religious uh -huh. i didn't study religion out of sort of like a um, a, a devoted belonging mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, to to something but i do like i do like philosophical ideas and i do like um thinking about how the human mind works and that and i think it's i think you can easily if you have a scientific mindset you know one trap is to get a little too reductive and and yep, yep. try to and you you know not really accept things until they are they are fully explained um mm -hmm. i think that's a very useful thing to have if you're doing science <laughs> that's right <laughs> and i'm actually uh. probably not scientific enough in the sense that I don't, I'm not really good at applying that kind of rigor and, um, and I'm not actually super systematic. Uh, 
what? <laughs> That's a surprise. Go ahead. Good. Um, so I, I, I like to kind of have an open mind about um, what's not, I, I'm intrigued by what's not yet understood or what's not in, in its nature easily explainable. Um, uh -huh. Uh -huh. And, and, you know, I was attracted to when I, when I did religion, it was both the sort of like how the human mind works, how societies work, what role religion plays in societal structure and power struggles and that kind of thing. But also I just, for a reason I can't like fully explain, but I just loved, you know, mythology. Yeah. The, yep. There's something awesome about mythology. Yeah, of course. Uh -huh. That is just, um, you know, essentially like good ancient literature um, with a little asterisk on it that, yeah, we sort of kind of claim that this actually really happened, you know, but, <laughs> but it's still like, I love the, uh, I love the, um, the brazen imperfection of many of, uh, many of, you know, the supposedly higher beings in many of the different religions and, yeah. and, and their humanity really. And how, what it, what the fact that people are telling these stories kind of said about themselves, I, that's always just fascinated me. So, so in Denmark, I'm assuming you, you had a lot of, you know, you had to kind of, you know, being interested in learning about mythology and all that, you probably had to know a lot about Norse gods and stuff like that. Is that what's, uh, what's popular on that side of the world? Or is it just an open, you know, kind of whatever you like to study? Mm -hmm. Well, that particular study is like, whatever you want to focus on. Yeah, yeah. There was no like requirement to go deep on anything. But I did it. it I did as a matter of you, part of it was you had to study some uh, original sources in yeah. their, in their original language. And, yeah, yeah. And uh, you couldn't just pick like German or something. Yeah. It has it had to yeah. be either it had to be sufficiently different from either from what's in, obvious and, distant mm. either in space or time they had kind of a sort of a sort of a rule around that and i chose distant in time and i i i learned some uh, old norse and i read some so and i did in fact study some of the norse um myths in their original language which was a, a large amount of fun and which kind of also went to my if you can say third or fourth or wherever we're at uh, interest at the time which was linguistics yeah yeah. So mm -hmm. so you had a you had a genuine authentic interest in linguistics anyway and how the brain works. I'm just trying to kind of connect yeah. the dots here I mean, because how can you, know, you not? Because it's super Yeah, I mean yeah, it's I was... very it's very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. You know mm -hmm. linguistics, I mean, you know, I, you know I somehow language carries, you know, stories within it. Like, you know, I'll t I'll tell you a story something that I saw in a movie the other day. So there were these investigators in Europe, right, who get raided every now and then by what well, what would you call them as per berserkers or berserkers? It's like a yeah, group yeah, of people. Yeah, yeah. Right. And what they noticed is that, you know, they these people would leave stuff behind them, right? You know, they would leave some of their writings and stuff like that behind them because they're they're raiding a place and then they're running away. And something interesting, you know, they were trying to find where these guys are coming from, right? They're trying to identify where they come from so they can stop their raids, right? And one interesting thing is that, you know, they looked at their writings, right? And they noticed that a lot of their writings is using terminology that belongs to other languages from other places. And that's how they started to eliminate the foreign terms in the language that they're using to identify. Like they would say palm trees. And they know that palm tree, that, that term belongs to a different nation, right? So they started eliminating one by one by one by one until they figured out where these guys are coming from because of the <laughs> foreign, <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll tell you something even, you know, you know, when I saw this, some guy here in the United States did something very similar. This is how they caught up the Unabomber, Ted Kaczynski, you know, that he published his manifesto. And the guy that was reading his manifesto, right, he started going through the terminologies, 
right, the terminology that he's using until he figured out that the style of writing that he's using is only for a group of people who graduated from Chicago in 1960s. Wow. It's crazy, man. It's like it's like it's like the guy created his own department in the CIA, right? Just by investigating. <laughs> Like, like, apparently there is something called, you know, like a terminology for the way you choose to express yourself. And that's very unique to the individual, right? Mm -hmm. Like, like we use the same words, we're speaking English, but how, like, I personally say materialize a lot. Like when I say, I say, how do you materialize your ideas? Right? So that's my own kind of dialect and going in and saying, okay, this is my way of expressing that. So language is very very it, it's like dna right it's it dna is, yeah, it, it is fascinating and it's because it's um because of its interplay between the uh between the the shared and the individual right yeah are, language evolves and moves around and all through the interactions of humans and mm. through the workings of their brain and uh, yeah i totally believe that we all have kind of like a linguistic signature, if you will, that is uh, yep. as, as unique and, and personal as our fingerprint or our, our DNA. Uh, that is, that and is the like word is I dialect, I think. It's something that identify you through your dialect, I think, mm -hmm. if I'm okay. not mistaken. But, but, but let me tell you this then. <sighs> Interest in linguistics, studying mythology, you know, music and all that, does does all of this have direct influence on you being interested to be, you know, someone whose daily job or main purpose to design a programming language for the world, a general purpose programming language? That's a good question. I think I, that, I mean, a, a major change happened for me, uh, I think, over time, which is I, I always thought, you know, young and idealistic, I always thought I would be kind of like, searching for the depths and the roots of everything. I wanted to be a researcher and I wanted to kind of find the deep truth about things. Uh -huh. And, um, you know, my university's motto was something like, uh, um, you know, uh, certainty is found in the depths or something like that. They were sort of like a dig deep and find their Yeah, root yeah find the answers, was, yeah. And that was uh, the career I kind of set out on. I was like, I'm, I'm going to be, uh, you know, I got interested in programming languages quickly. You no, know, you know, I was interested in programming and in languages. It was a matter of time, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so, <laughs> and uh, and started out uh, on a PhD. And uh, when I started out, I, I took, took the path. PhD, You're going, yeah. Took mm -hmm. the path. Uh, um, thought I was going to be a researcher, and I gradually realized that I wasn't actually. cut out for it in a way that it was mm. not uh, the things that I enjoyed the most. It turned out weren't so much the, what the, you thought it would be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The laborious digging and, and eliminating and comparing. And it was the, it was getting ideas. It was thinking outside of the box. It was innovating and it was, and, and so sort of on the, on the sort of, um, intellectual side of it. And then on the social side of it, I, I also really didn't like the sort of lone wolf um, atmosphere that that there was in academics. Um, I, I loved every chance I got at collaboration. I felt like the best ideas were had, the, the most creativity was had when you were with people, mm -hmm. and sort of brain, brainstorming together. And I kind of realized that I'm not actually all that good at coming up with things all on my own. And I'm not all that good when I do, I'm not all that good at chasing them down until I, I, I've got them like fully nailed. Mm -hmm. I need to be in a collective um, kind of hive mind. Environment. Kind of, yeah. And also, yeah. I mean, a lot of what made me realize these things was that I get, I got a chance. I was really like, got a chance. It was super yeah. serendipitous to work on Java and yeah. to be involved in Java generics. And, um, as I got deeper and deeper into that, I just had more and more fun. Like it was just like, this is what I'm supposed this to do. This is what I want to do. I found yeah, it. This is good. <laughs> the only thing about the sort of traditional research job I liked was the teaching. I, I enjoyed the teaching. Uh, but um, but it was like the innovating with real real people and for real people. Like yeah. 
actual yeah. there's actual collaboration about coming up with the things and there are actual real uses millions of them in java's case yeah. uh that that are you know will actually be subjected to these these things and that are real uses that you know yeah. real world constraints also like this isn't this isn't the you know java wasn't the ideal programming language by any stretch and neither is c sharp but it was yeah. like um but it was there and it it was and, available and it, the chance is there and it right? Did something, right it it um it people were connecting with it yeah and, and you could make it you could make it better and better and better and and um sort of have a, a positive feedback loop and i was like at that point at some point in there i realized well i could either sort of do that part-time or less even less than part-time mm -hmm. while being paid university wages and having to do all the other stuff or i could kind of try to see if i can go and make that my job you know <laughs> right right <laughs> and uh -huh. as a second sort of uh serendipity thing i ran into anders heilsberg at a conference in denmark and um uh, just as i was talking about java generics and he was talking about c sharp generics at the same conference and interesting it was interesting. just too just you know, just like this like yeah, it's just a uh, fate <laughs> it had to happen you know yeah. so um so, so, so so it, so yeah it was, mm -hmm. go, ahead. Go, ahead, go ahead go ahead Matt. please go ahead yeah, i was go just ahead. like i mean i'm sort of just saying the rest is history in a way like then uh, a few months later i was interviewing at microsoft and a year later i was working here so you were originally you were already engaged in developing generics for Java. You were already, but the, you know the thing that really actually is very personable, and the thing that I just stood up to me out of this story is that you didn't just stop where you landed because a lot of people say, okay, this is the path that I think I should take, and then they get stuck in there for years mm -hmm. and years, and they're not really happy. But you kept searching. You kept trying different things. So you went that PhD path and then you thought, I want to try something else, right? When did you, like at some point in time, you know, and this is just an advice for younger people everywhere, including myself, I want to, uh, that I'm young, but I just want to know what, you know, when do you call it off? When you, when do you go and say, I'm not getting what I want out of this? Do you have like a year time frame, six months, whenever it felt it felt like it didn't make sense anymore? I wouldn't think there is an equation, but I want to know what Mads thinks, you know, when it comes to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, let's see. So I I think all else equal, I probably waited too long. You know, I took the, the whole PhD and then I worked as a professor for four years eventually nice. before before I was uh, before the change was complete. Nice. So I think I probably let it run for too long. I wouldn't make it go that long. But I think we all I mean, we all have ups and downs. Yeah, of course. And, yeah. and I think you have to be careful, of course, not to say, well, I'm having a bad day or I'm having a bad week or and I'm going to throw month. it off. Yeah. And so uh, I probably need to do something else. You know, I yeah. Mean, yeah. That there are risks on both sides where um, I think it's important to take the time if you're i mean if, if and even if you're feeling for a while something isn't right mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. it, it's important to find out what what isn't right and i mm -hmm. think you can take you can take various approaches to it um one is to think a lot and and sort of introspect a lot um talking mm -hmm. to people is better <laughs> yep yeah uh, uh it's never never sit alone with a problem like that for very yeah. long you know find so, someone that you mm -hmm. that you trust mm -hmm. um or or if you don't already have someone in your life that you trust to have that kind of conversation just grab someone that you yeah. you know i mean it's really important to talk things through and get these just like just like with language design and you know yeah. figuring out your life it's also the you know the um the brainstorming and collective approach is actually important so, so seek advice ask people talk to people Absolutely. you know talk to even if you don't know someone grab someone and and talk to them yeah, you even know the sparring even if they're no smarter than you at like, even if they're not like therapists or whatever just talk yeah. to someone else because if you want to find out what it is that's broken otherwise you end up fixing the wrong thing but of course Some, there is another approach which is mm -hmm. an experimental approach right where you say let me try something else let yeah, brute force. Yeah. Try everything. Yeah, Try something else. until it clicks. It's just <laughs> right. that you end up maybe throwing out several babies with the bathwater if you're not careful. Because every time you build relationships and you build kind of like um, 
a life around your purpose. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so here's here's one for you. So it clicked. You just started playing around with Java, and it clicked. It just made sense. You know, this is what I want. This is what I want to do. Right now, when you find your purpose, you find something that you're super excited about. You know. Do you just settle or do you look at the next big thing? I know the answer to that. I know what you do normally because I know you, but I, I've been watching your sessions, contributions, work in the open source community. But you have you, you must agree with me that you know when you find your passion, it requires continuous investment, right? You can't just say I found it and that's it, you know? Uh, I mean, I, I, mean I, I certainly... I mean, it's hard to answer because I think part of my passion is continuous investment, right? It's like, yes, I, yes. I, oh, I my, see. Mm, at the heart mm. of my passion is I like coming up with things. I like finding out new things. And I can't, I can't say that's everybody's passion. I, yeah, I, yeah. Do think, I do think that most people um, thrive from some sort of what we call growth, right? Most people thrive from not being stuck in a rut. Yep. Yep. But that doesn't mean that you have to necessarily, I mean, it's always nice if you can grow in the sense that you make more money over time or something, yeah. <laughs> get more financial freedom or whatever, but not everybody, it's not, I don't think it's necessarily right for everyone that they'll, that their job is their passion and it's the thing that gives their lives meaning and all that. Uh, I think sometimes that's a little overrated. I think yeah. you have to, you, happiness isn't net, necessarily always move in movement and in change you know um sometimes just settling and sometimes being... settling it yeah it's yeah I mean, there's also restlessness can also be too much right and i yeah, got, yeah. oh I, I by the time i finished that thing i was aiming for i was already uh, have you know half out the door <laughs> to the next thing that's also yeah. not necessarily fulfilling so i think sometimes in certainly in american society maybe men in Western societies, there's a, there's sort of like a worship of workaholism, always, always yeah. striving and always, yeah, yeah, always that's look out for the next thing. And, and I, I see the value of it. I, I really yeah. do, but, but you also have to be careful with that. It, it, yep. it stretches you thin. It yep. lets you not stop and enjoy the moment and smell the roses and, you know, yeah. So you you enjoy the the very process of evolution, evolving something, coming up with new ideas. Not so th this blows my mind. I, let me tell you why. You know, normally I always thought about evolving something and growing it as means to the actual purpose, which is the stale state of an evolved product. But you enjoy the process of evolution itself. You enjoy the process of, you know, having something, coming up with new ideas and trying these. This is amazing. I've never heard this before. I never, ever heard this before. This is great insight, you know, and maybe I don't have the level of exposure, but this is this is definitely interesting. Now, let me ask you this. When you create something, okay, you enjoy the very process of evolution, which is amazing. That's your it's like built in natively. You like to make things better all the time. That's great. I don't think that's, I don't think that's, it's all that uncommon. <laughs> it's, really. it's not that uncommon. I, I, I need to, I need to hang out with more people like Mads. I'll tell you that much. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's definitely, you know, uh, eye opening for me. Uh, but the other thing I wanted to, to ask you about okay, you love the process of evolving things. What are the top highest priorities? that you consider when you are evolving something you're always evolving towards something you like to come up with new ideas right i want to come up with new ideas here's a here's the out of the box null check <laughs> okay bang bang boom <laughs> we check this guy is not null before we even hit oh maybe you know uh, argument null exception throw if null and you're just adding a new capability or something like that outside the box what are the three things that you care about the most and if you can come up with one that's okay too it's not like written in the book that it has to be three but you know whatever comes to mind when you're thinking about the next big thing that you want to build what do you care about the most matt um well i 
care there okay i think the answer is a little different depending on whether we talk about me as a person or me doing my job <laughs> you as a person this um, is about you yeah, <laughs> okay, um, go ahead. well i do okay i care about there being a real problem to solve i think um mm. it's important mm -hmm. not to have solutions looking for problems solutionism i hate and, uh, it yes yeah. well, i guess mm -hmm. that's a word yeah mm -hmm. uh, so i so that it that has to be there somehow and that um and of course as a language designer i care about the solution being sufficiently general while okay. also still being sufficiently applicable you know um so I, I feel like I talk about all kinds of things having to be in balance. And this is another one, right? You have yes. to be general enough that you you can only put so many things in a language. It has to be general enough that it, it addresses as many scenarios as reasonable. But at the same time, it can't be so abstract that nobody can think it. So Nice. Nice. Okay. So there's something there about finding the right level of abstraction. Of course, it's really juicy if something is difficult <laughs> to figure out. <laughs> That's your bread and butter right there. Um, That's your thing. Uh -huh. And this is where, this is probably the part that is me, not so much my job, which is that I certainly enjoy working on difficult problems. And, and it's fine to expend a lot of mental effort working on a difficult problem and then throwing it away because you just couldn't find a solution. I, um, and then you get a one out of 10 or you work on it for 10 years and finally something starting to take shape or whatever, that's all fine, you know? Yeah. And yeah. Um, of course, when we actually, def def you know, when we evolve the language, we there's again, a, a, a notion of balance. We want to do some of each of many things in each release. We want to have some good syntactic sugar that just, or whatever, like you know, simp simplification of your code. We want to have some new expressiveness that is deeper and and actually let you say new things, not just yep. the same yeah. things in a shorter way. Yep. Uh, we want to have some things for the performance crowd that are like working more at the low level, making sure we evolve all those stories at the same time. Um, mm -hmm. And and for some of that, in particular, maybe the the deep expressiveness. Some of those things tend to be in flight for many, many years, like the, um, the, the static abstract uh, members and interfaces that we are adding now, they've, the first prototype of that was way over a decade ago. Yeah, um, yeah. And um, it just has to sort of mature. The, um, the, um, the scenarios need to be relevant enough. The, the technology around it needs to be ready. Um, the, the mindset in the organization has to be, there are all these things that like, oh, one day it's actually like, okay, we can, we can do this. We can change the runtime. We can, um, uh, you know, people are more interested maybe in say the math scenarios, you know, there, it just at some point might, there might be a, a confluence of things that make, okay, now, now we're ready to move on this. So, so Mads, what's something you wish we could have in C Sharp today? Something big. Something that you see in other languages. Well, if I see something in another language and I want it, you know, You'll I, just, make it. I just steal it. <laughs> That's not a problem, you know. I we'll, know. we'll find a way. <laughs> I you mean, know, we, I... <laughs> we, we do get accused of, of theft. I don't... I mean, no, it's not theft. It's 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 actually influence and uh, yeah. appreciation, you know. Actually, I and I think you know you know what, what what they say. You know, like when you mimic someone, you know, when you try to kind of be influenced by something, that's the biggest form of flattery. You're basically right. looking at. And by the way, most of programming languages are nothing but influence. You know, have you ever? You I know you did. You know, there's this huge tree on the internet where they say, okay, what is the programming languages ancestry, right? So programming languages ancestry, and this is a, one of the most popular like 
There it is. Not this, not even this one. Look at this one, Mads. This is the one that I show to people all the time. Let yeah. me open, let me open this in a um in a new tab. I hope it's big enough. Oh, this is terrible. Okay, hold on. Let's find a better one. You know, I guess in general, you can tell like most programming languages are very heavily influenced by each other. And this just happened. There it is. This is the one that I like the most. Um, I've seen this like years and years ago. See, mm -hmm. if you go from the top, from Fortran to Algo Basic, Visual Basic, look, C Sharp is sitting here being influenced by Visual Basic and Delphi, Java from C++ and C and B and BCPL. I'm pretty sure you know half of these, you know, if not worked with them already. So this is the influence that we're talking about. You know, you're yes, looking yes. at a programming language. I bet C sharp today is much more has much more arrows coming through to it, you know, than it is in this image. It's a little bit older. This is from 2000, you know. But uh, but still, l let me ask you this. <clears throat> Again, you know, what's a thing you really love to have? I know you would just go implement it. So you have something, a few things in the pipeline. You know, I always have this myself. If I if I deploy a library or something, I'd be like, okay, the next big thing is for us to do that, right? right. Um, what do you wish we have in C Sharp? So there are a couple of things in the pipeline that are harder because um, they may not be so easily stealable. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are one that we're looking at right now that is very much still experimental. We're still trying to figure out if we can find a way to do it even with runtime help. Mm -hmm. um, we call it roles and extensions. It's sort okay. of like an approach to um, more separation of concerns. Okay. You know, when, when people use, um, when people advocate structural typing, you know, yep. they always, you know, strong typing, but structural, they always say, you know, it's so great because then you can take a thing from over here and a thing from over here that were completely unrelated. And then you can make them work together because it's structural types. So they yep. just, they look the same. They are the same. And I'm, I always feel like there's a little bit of BS in that because. <laughs> JavaScript. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. In, in practice, things don't just end up looking the same, you know. That's right. That's right. They, they, they will always have little differences and stuff. Um, TypeScript finds a, a good kind of. Um, Balance. Okay. A good balance there. It's it's a structural type system, but because you have a tendency to name types and like you will describe interfaces, you you will in fact have shared artifacts to rally around. But yeah. then you are not much better than a, than C sharp actually. Yeah. Because yeah, we also have interfaces as shared artifacts. Yeah. And the fact that the classes or the implementing types explicitly mention those interfaces rather than sort of just structurally depend yeah. on them doesn't really there's still like the same set of dependencies in there yeah so how, yeah. Do, you, how do you truly take things that are unrelated and make and them, make them yeah yeah and that is a juicy problem and i think i think and and um and we have ideas there that you can at least sort of do it that strike a different perform set of performance trade-offs or at, not just performance trade-offs, but in general, yeah, just design trade-offs than what's out there today. And it's fun to play with. It may not, it may not turn out to work out, but if it does, I feel like we can, that can really have sort of like a software engineering impact where your dependencies yeah. uh, become less um, and um, less restrictive. You can, it, if it fits, it fits. If I'm taking a student model, and yeah. whatever model that is being passed in fits the same, say, structure. Yeah. You know, it, then... Essentially, the core of the idea is if it doesn't fit, I can make it fit. I have a feature for making it fit. <laughs> See what I'm saying? There's an interface right. over there. There's a class over there. Yeah. You know, they conceptually, it makes sense that one could be the other. But it so happens that the two authors had no contact and they weren't thinking about each other. But I need nice. them to fit together. I need, nice. I need these things to fit into the this framework over here, and and how can I say okay this this one might be called name and this might be called full name and this one yeah. might this might take the parameters in a different order or you know these little details how can I sort of specify how can I give a recipe for 
how to fit that thing into that thing. So, so Mads, you want to make Auto Mapper native outside of the box in C Sharp? Did I get that? <laughs> Forgive my small brain. I'm trying to kind of yes. map it to something. I... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because that's, that's it's, not bad. It, it sounds a little bit like mapping, if I'm not mistaken. It's, no, not, even, it's not even mapping. It's more like, I know what you're trying to do. You're fitting things. Like, yeah. you know, if, if I have a Walkman and there is a cassette that goes into that Walkman, even if there is some completely different form factor that fits that very exact same prototype, It'll work even if it wasn't intended to be for that. And oh my God, man, you're you're something else. <laughs> it's I, mean, I, had, I had an old car that had a it, you, you say cassette player made yeah. the thing. Um, it there was no USB, uh, no Bluetooth, no nothing. Yeah. <laughs> but of course, I had no cassette tapes anymore. And uh -huh. you can now you can just buy a, a cassette tape shaped thing that you for can that stick CD. in there. And yep. then the cable kind of coming out of it. I that saw you that. Put into That's your phone. It. That's it. That's and, it right there. Mm -hmm. And now you've mm -hmm. fit. It's and it's these kinds of things are called adapters. And it's really about adapting, right? It's sort yeah. of like, yeah, things don't fit, but we can make them fit. Yep. 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 <laughs> mm -hmm. that's, so that's one thing. Uh, just philosophically. Uh, you know, it's philosophically easy to think about in a way, but what what the actual language feature around it should be that that gets the job done in a way that is um, palatable and and efficient enough and so on. That's a big challenge, but th that's the kind of thing that it's, you know, that that thing has already been going around for more than half a decade for sure. And yeah, it'll probably be a couple of releases before we, even that's if it does that. succeed before, be, before it does, but, but hey, that, that, that kind of work has to happen too. a kind of long lead yeah, keep of course. Moving, keep trying. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So so okay. So here's here's the opposite of that. Something that we could have lived without in C sharp. <laughs> oh. You may say it's perfect and the world it's all bunnies and rainbows out there and there's nothing wrong. <laughs> I know you wouldn't, but it's just You're right. Saying. I mean there are definitely these things that are no longer the best mm -hmm. way of doing things. There are also things that were never the right way of doing things. I will, um, I often, actually, hmm. I delegates, you know, yeah. um, that yeah. they are the function type of .NET. Yeah. Okay. They're also a collection type. They, you can add delegates together and then you have multiple individual functions Yep. And if you and if you execute the added together delegate, they will execute one in a row, and I think you get the result of the last one or the first one or some random yep. like that. That is like uh -huh. who ordered that? And, and yeah. I, I, right. I happen to know the answer. Uh -huh. The uh, not necessarily who ordered that, but it was you know that was you know C sharp and and their accompanying libraries were being developed at a time when kind of like an observer pattern style of eventing was mm -hmm. all the rage and mm -hmm. so it's kind of building that it that in a little too deeply like it's so delegates are both the actual function type that you can convert a, a given function to yep but it's also the collection that you can gather up all the um all the subscriptions is, is that way. why is that why we have funks today is that why mm -hmm. or actually? yeah it was like we don't have proper function types that are sort of structural or whatever, and we don't have so, and we don't have really a standardized library. So let's make one. So around C sharp three, um, we said let's actually create some standard delegate types. Now that we have good generics, uh, we can do it. That was C sharp two. We got the generics and C sharp three. We're like, now we're starting to get do more functional things around link language integrated query and so on. So. Um, it really sucks to have to write all these yeah. get types. And that we that that game is just not scaling. So let's at least write some that that cover most needs. So you have delegate uh -huh. and action. Uh -huh. And by the way, I wish we had unified void and in with the in with return types when we had the chance instead of having that bifurcation. But oh well, maybe one day. Um, <laughs> yeah. 
but um, that that kind of at least puts a lid on most of it. It it still doesn't help you if you have more than a zillion parameters. Mm -hmm. But that's like okay, if you have that, you're already in trouble. So that's fine. But yep. more problematically, it doesn't help if you have ref or out parameters or anything like that. They all have to be value parameters to work. But gotcha. You know. Um, that was that kind of papered it over enough that we haven't really come back to make better function types. Yep, yep. And and I think I think the nature of, of this industry in general is that a new pattern emerge and then the older pattern just starts to kind of fade away slowly but surely. I guess we're as engineers, we want it to be zero or one, right? I mean, we yeah. got the new thing, let's make it disappear and let, let's have the new thing. But I think the very the very nature of the slow evolution in the tech industry gives us, you know, as engineers, enough space to kind of see whether the new proposed solution is actually a better, a better alternative or not, which is kind of important. Like you're proposing a new solution. Is it actually, you know, one of the, one of the most amazing things you just said, you said, I want to develop things that can cover cases nobody can think of. That's amazing. Like if you're building in a way that can cover up possibilities, that nobody can just even, you know, comprehend how much the possibilities are. Okay, let's shift the talk a little bit. You know, let's go back to maths. <laughs> you know, just a little bit, you know, <laughs> a little bit of nerdy talk, but I really want to get to know you and all that kind of stuff. You know, so so these days, you know, you love, you know, you this is your passion, this is your work. You love the evolution process, right? What do you do when you kind of wake up one day and feel I don't feel it today. I don't feel that fire, that energy, right? Uh, how do you bring yourself back up in the game when you feel like, I, I don't feel like doing anything, you know? Um, I, you probably don't. <laughs> you love C Sharp so much. <laughs> no, ahead. no, I do. I do. Good, I mean, um, mm -hmm. things can definitely be difficult. Well, they're sort of like, there are several answers to that. Sometimes you just like, well, maybe, maybe just go easy on yourself today and don't actually nice. feel it. Mm -hmm. um, there's sort of like a what to do before that, which is, um, you know, a make sure you don't work on something you hate, but also, mm -hmm. you know, try to try to do your part in creating an environment, a work environment um for yourself and your colleagues that is yeah. in, in it's inviting and supportive uh -huh. and and flexible and forgiving you know yep yep um, yep try to try to have a paid forward mentality about these things as well when um when people who are you know less experienced than you are, uh, are getting into the game and so on and try to just try to be um, just mm -hmm. ma make space for everyone. Yeah. 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 And allow, allow others to grow in a way. Like, yeah. Allow, and mm, try to, mm. uh, try to uh, create an atmosphere of respect and, and empathy. And, um, and if you're part of such an atmosphere, uh, then that question really, becomes much easier to answer. Maybe it is, you know, hey, I'm not feeling it today. Can we move that meeting? Yeah, yeah. And it will be totally OK because people will okay. understand. Yeah. 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 And uh, so mm -hmm. and I think that is. That's also something people often forget that we are we are full human beings. We don't mm -hmm. just we don't just leave part of ourselves at home and go to work like of course to some degree we put on a mask or you know put on a yep. professional identity and that's fine yeah um, it's not that you have to bear it all you know and share all your all your innermost secrets but yep. but you want to feel comfortable and you want to feel um appreciated and um and accommodated uh, i think that goes for everyone and and um you know you can you can contribute to that it's also something that I think people should expect. And uh, if if they're in a situation where they can't, then that would not certainly I know if I were yeah. for all that I love C sharp and for all that I think this is the best 
uh, thing I could be doing in the world. Like it's the best yeah. job I could have in the whole world. Like yeah. if if the work environment was hostile or competitive or like nasty it. or and I couldn't change it, I you know it's not worth it. Right? This is not where I should be. No, yeah. no matter how how great it is intellectually. So that's that I think is an important thing to for everyone to try to try to achieve. And I know it can be hard sometimes. I know you got to always have to like sometimes you do have to compromise a little, but try not to be um yeah. Like the competitive thing. So let me ask you this, you know, authenticity is fundamental to innovation. What do you think about that? Like 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 being your very very self like you said without having to kind of share your innermost secrets authenticity bringing your very true self every day you know what you like what you don't like you know is this fundamental to innovation does this influence innovation i'm sure it's a factor but i i'm, I'm not sure it's fundamental actually i think what's fundamental actually is feeling safe nice that's nice. Probably mm -hmm. is the core. You can't be creative, and you can't well, learn, and you mm -hmm. can't listen, and you can't think if you're feeling threatened. That's right. That's true. It's something true. that I actually learned from Anders Heilsberg. Um, like the way he did the design process. I don't want to come back to C sharp design necessarily, but that's okay. I know he's. Yep. Please go ahead. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a. He had a fundamental realization, and and. You know, remember this man is a genius. Like yep. he could yep. he could design his own programming language without any help if he wanted to, but he doesn't right. want to because mm -hmm. he knows it's better if there's a creative process with people in it. And Mark, it's much more fun with people. Mm -hmm. And right. he knows that you only have fun and get creative if you feel safe and if you feel and if it feels like a collaboration, not a competition or a negotiation. So gotcha. you get people in a room and you create an atmosphere of, of trust and, um, and safety. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there are a couple of ways that that plays out. Um, you know, you pick the right people, you set the right tone. You, even if you look at the C-sharp design notes today, Yep. Uh, that are now public, like they used yep. to need to be. And it was a big it was a big question to even make them public because does that actually threaten the feeling of safety that we have in there? Right, right. And but on the other hand, if you look, you'll never find a name. You'll never find and then Mad said and then Jared That's said. True. That's true. That's very true. Yeah. They yep. are they are completely anonymous with respect to the people who were in there. And so which people could feel safe. Mm. Who had the great idea? Who asked the stupid question? It doesn't matter. Nobody gets, for, for good or bad, nobody gets credit. Nobody gets shade. It's, it's the whole team. We all win. Yeah. Exactly. We all lose. Nice. And that means that what, is, so what, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas when it comes to that. <laughs> right. yeah, that's also why we don't, we still don't stream them. Even a lot of people would love for us to stream the language design meetings, but we just don't want to get that element of performance in there or that, that, that would be a distraction to the to the to the actual purpose. Mm. What what does what does Mads do when he's not working? Like, what do you do to kind of ch chillax, you know, and just blow off, blow off steam, you know? Like, for instance, I personally just play first person shooter games, right? If I'm not with my family, my kids, and all that, I'll pick up a Halo game and I'll just go crazy online. <laughs> you know, you know, if you're with me on the same server, you'll just see the lunatics that's running around the map, just getting everybody. <laughs> what do you do to kind of chillax? I I consume entertainment. I, I read books. Nice. Um, kind of like 50-50 fiction and nonfiction. Nice. I nice. I watch TV series some dumb and some clever i uh -huh. people often ask me what's your hobby and i'm like yeah i don't really have one. <laughs> i think i work you, uh, you, you you innovate that's your hobby i i know that you love that like i do but i but i do certainly also love coming home from work and then yeah being yep. done for the day you know yep, and, yep. And, and taking yep, my yep. brain off of things and i don't if if i'm in a period where there's some work problem that's bugging me. 
and I keep, can't stop thinking of it, that's not a good yeah. thing. I don't. That's yeah. not. That's not mentally healthy. Um, so I be with my family. Um, Movies, go out books. with friends. <laughs> go out with it's friends. Very, yeah, it's very basic, you know. Actually, Matt, the, if... newspaper, <laughs> the physical paper newspaper. I do that too. Do the dope. <laughs> Here's one for you. If you're stuck on an island and you get to only have one book and one movie, what would that be? <laughs> <laughs> one book and one movie. Yeah, something you would recommend, you would read for eternity and never get enough of. I don't know that that's there. I will say, I mean, there. Are, when I was younger, I'm one of those people who, who have read the Lord of the Rings like 10 times or something. Yeah, yeah. I, by now, I feel like I'm kind of done with it, actually. It's, it's, it's a <laughs> I'm done with it. <laughs> yeah, okay, 10 times was enough. Oh, man, I dressed up like Gandalf today for nothing? Okay. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I, haven't, I haven't said goodbye to the universe. I look forward to the new TV series and all that. You know, it's, but uh, uh, just to say that I know what you mean. Like, had you asked me in my youth, that's clearly the one I would have said. Lord of the Rings. And I just easy. keep coming back to that. So easy enough. Yeah. How about how about this? Something you read recently that kind of so ma made you go, "This is interesting." I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. I will. Man. I will narrow it down to there's one author that I I have a special relationship to in terms of their their fiction, uh -huh. which is Neil Stevenson, and he's okay. from, he's from Seattle. Okay. Um, it's very nerdy writing. <laughs> <laughs> and his books are never less than a thousand pages. Wow. I think the is more like 3,000 pages. Oh my God. And very complex and flawed in many ways. But there's something about them that means that there are the. Some of his books are the only ones that I really sort of keep coming back to. I think the most relevant for. <laughs> His first really good book and the most relevant for many people in this business is Cryptonomicon. Yeah. yeah. And, um, you know, just the the depth of because um, it, you know, it also deals with Alan Turing and so on. And that's it's, it's flawed in many ways. When I read it, I'm like, eh, that bit is like silly and whatnot. But yeah. there's something about it that I just keep coming back to. And, and I keep enjoying he's the only author i kind of like chase down and make sure i get to like a book reading when there's a new thing that comes out nice. try to get a signed copy you know <laughs> get one my dad nice. as well nice. and um it, you know it, there's just something about that that really clicks with me the it's i think it's that breadth of interest like he's not like focused on one thing he just gets interested in so many things and he can yeah. convey that interest in a way that also tells a good story and uh, so i would i would look long and hard at the shelf and i would probably just just since i get to keep stick to only one book mm -hmm. i would sort of i would bend the rules and pick the one that's in three volumes like the longest one just because <laughs> that would be the most words I, I got to bring on that island so that would be the baroque cycle um okay yeah. Okay. What's what's Mad's second favorite programming language? <laughs> See what I did there? <laughs> I really don't have one. Okay. I think um and and that's the that's the honest truth. There's yes, there's yes. not a there's not a programming language that I feel fully at home in. Not even C sharp. I, okay. in, in some ways, my ev evolution of C sharp is me trying to bring it closer and closer to that. Yeah, um, that's the only language I have any say over. <laughs> <laughs> I, there are many languages that I like the idea of them and the philosophy of them, and then when it comes to specifics, there's always something that's like, ah, that's you know, it's I don't want to do that. <laughs> it's always going to be imperfect. And, it, and the world of programming languages also evolves just as the individual programming languages do, at least the good ones. Yeah. Um, yep. So I, I don't know that it exists. Um, okay. And, and that's fine, you know. Yeah, yeah that's totally that okay. Is, I mean... That is um, it, that it's imperfection at new levels all the yep. time. And, and it uh, that every time we hit our head, sufficiently or stub our toes sufficiently many times we're like 
eventually someone will overcome that hurdle and that and something else will become easier I, you I, know, wanna... I thought mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i thought concurrency was going to be the bane of all our programming languages and then when we got async we were kind of able to paper over it enough like using futures with yeah, tasks, few, net, yeah but it's kind of like a general purpose they turn out to be really good at kind of just pushing most of that under the rug. It's still occasionally a problem. Then you mix in a little immutability and you're kind of good to go. And now it's no longer the, you know, the, it's not it's not fabulous. Yeah, it's just like we haven't really has found it. we haven't found the sort of like the next yeah. Yeah. But yeah. On the other hand, we're kind of like, we're okay. Well if if you're a little we, we have it. We're fine. We're, yeah. We're good, you know. M Mads, mm -hmm. by the way, you know, I gotta I gotta really appreciate you're very, very consistent. And I'll tell you why I'm saying that. Because the very fact, this very answer that you just made, you know, I don't know if I have one, a favorite programming language, and falling in love with the very process of evolution and innovation. That just, just exact match, you know, of what you're actually believing in and what you, what you chase. Here's one more for you. And then, you know, maybe you'll you'll tell the youngsters out there, actually everybody, you know, maybe something from your advice. What do you think about what do you think about aspect oriented programming? <clears throat> Being oh, able to mm -hmm. that's been, that's a while since that came up. Yeah, and I have something for you, but let's just see what you have. Go ahead. So uh, aspect oriented programming as sort of originally conceived, I have a problem with. Yep. In the, the sense, hidden code. <laughs> in the Go sense ahead. that you write some code and you think you're deploying that code, but someone oh, actually, actually something else some, code. <laughs> something messes with it and yep. and and turns it into something else. And there, yep. there's something like too intrusive about yep. it in my taste. Yep. And at yep. the same time, I I recognize where it's coming from, that there's, there are aspects of, uh, of um, expressiveness that can't be sufficiently abstracted over. Yep. So, yep. so what aspect oriented programming tries to do is instead of saying, well, let's put this abstraction mechanism in so that we can leave, you know, mm -hmm. uh, hooks or whatever. Um, let's skip that and just sort of hack it in wherever it seems to fit, you know? Um, I, so I get, I get the problem. And I, and I think that we always kind of, we, we always have these places. C sharp has tons of them too, where we just don't have the abstraction mechanisms for generalizing over this or for, or for opening up for customization in, at a certain point. Yep. Yeah. Um, yep. And, um, that's, uh, that's a problem regardless of whether you then want to evolve those, those to having those abstraction mechanisms or you, even if you try to shortcut that with something like aspect oriented programming, that's yeah. only, again, that's only going to work for certain things, right? Yeah. And, it's not always going to be. And, and if I, if I could just uh, share some thoughts, you know, mm -hmm. let's see what you think about, you know, this is how I look at, uh, I'm gonna draw. Uh, I'm gonna draw a map with you. Is that okay? I'm gonna draw a little map with you. Sure. So we're object-oriented programming, right? That means that our objects are sort of, from our perspective, is kind of 3D, right? So when you're building a class for a student or a car or an animal, whatever the case may be, you're thinking about a 3D model because you, you, we just said object, right? Objects normally are perceived in three dimensions, right? This is how I work around this. And let's see what you think about it. What I decided to start doing to express certain different aspects in different language and C sharp is to basically go and say, why don't I employ partial classes? Mm -hmm. But that's a hack. That's just me working around the capability to say, oh, there is aspect. Actually, I want to show you something, Maz. You might like this a lot. Let's see what you think. This is how I use your language to express a 3D object, right? A 3D object. How do I do that? I basically go like this and I say, well, you know, if I have a certain programming language that that I'm trying to express a service, for instance, right? So you have a, a, a certain service 
And this service is basically, there is aspect of it where it handles the exceptions and there's aspect of it where it handles the logging and there's aspect of it where it handles the, the business logic and there's aspect where it handles the validation. It's infinite number of perspective, right? So what do I do? I go and do something like this. Let me show you. This is an open source project. It's not like something internal or anything. So here's, here's my project. This is what I go do. And let's see what you think about that. I go and I say, okay, you have this service here. And this service, I don't know if the font is big enough, Matt. I could increase it. Can you see well, that? I mean, uh, uh, it should I be mean, on. Uh. In uh, in your, your your streaming app here. So I'm getting a, a relatively small. I guess the the let, viewers let, will get a bigger version of this than I get right now. <laughs> no, let me let me increase the font actually because I actually need to. So can you see the tree now? I just increased the I font. Can. Okay, and I can do this little trick here, which makes it really, really large. So, so here's what I do. I go into a student service. This is your student service right here, right? And I go and break it into partial classes underneath that very same service, right? Mm -hmm. And then I do a little, um, it's a little, you know, kind of tricky thing. So this is my business logic here. Look at this. And I'm wrapping it in... I know we hate delegates, you know, maybe switch it to funks, but this wrapper here goes and represents handling the exceptions of that their very same function. So I don't have to create like a noise, like a pollution, you know, like mm -hmm. if I put all the exception handling in here, I don't see these two guys anymore because there's many, many lines of exceptions that I have to take care of, right? Yes, yes. What do you think about that? <laughs> I, I'm really, you know, I'll tell you why I'm talking to you about this. I use C Sharp. I've been using it for 20 something years now. And I love this language. You know, I love to think about things and just make it happen. Right. And now I thought object oriented programming begs for 3D multi dimensional object. What do you think about that? Aspects, an aspect from here, an aspect from here. So you're not adding the code wherever it fits anymore. The code is there, it's just spread across multiple you know, partial or aspect classes. <laughs> I, I really, I'm interested to know what you I, think about so this. I, I think that the, um, I mean, the use of partial classes obviously is um, a good trick for separating concerns. Yeah. Uh, it only works within the same compilation. Yeah. Um, but that's also a good thing because it means that you see you're everything. Not, mm -hmm. You're not intruding on someone else. You're just intruding on yourself. So to yeah. Speak. <laughs> <laughs> as long as you can keep um, anything that lets you pull different aspects, different dimensions, as you call it, yeah. uh, into separate spaces is probably good. We often, I mean, the one we often talk about also in language design is the business logic, right? Yeah. That is sort of like the core logic, if you will. Yeah, yeah. And trying to come up with ways to not have that drown. Um, sometimes we can do language things around that, but it's it's good to also... Uh, find architectural ways to separate that code and, and maybe uh, parameterize that code more so that you are not lumping everything together, but you actually yeah. have some way of, that's why I talked about hooks, right? Or, yeah. you yeah. know, one way one way that people do that or is, you know, dependency injection like uh, ways of- Kind of fashion you know, of, yeah. Yeah, you sort of feed in handlers or doers or objects that are not, part of the business model uh -huh. uh, that's the wrong word to use but the, the uh the business logic yeah worldview yeah uh, <laughs> but that are sort of control objects if you will that's right there's one thing there i want to put you uh, uh if we can nerd a little bit here yeah let's um, go <laughs> we are we have in preview now um uh static virtuals and in interfaces um, which is um, primarily, you know, the first scenario that we're chasing down with that is generic math because operators are static. And if you can make those virtual in an interface, then mm -hmm. you can actually say, I have an interface that represents something that has plus minus. And mm -hmm. so that, you know, cool. Mathematical abstraction, uh, it's a thing. But one thing that we are finding and already starting to make use of even in the, uh, in the BCL code is that there are actually many of those kinds of design patterns that use that kind of like mindset in terms strategy of strategy object where you sort of have an object that is there to to represent a strategy 
Mm -hmm. You can actually lift that up to the type level and say, instead, I have an interface. Instead of an abstract class, I have an interface representing the strategy with static, static virtual or abstract methods in it. Oh, and I like then, that. And then mm. you can pass it. Then you can take it. The 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 consuming code can be can be generically parameterized over that. You can take um, a type parameter that's constrained by that interface, and now you can call the static members and interview. You're not creating these artificial objects to pass around. And okay. It, I, I'll I'm try. not saying that necessarily better, but it's another. It was interesting. We talked about it today. Actually, yeah, yeah we had yeah. Anderson and, and Fowler, and uh, those people are actually visiting today. Um, and we talked about the um, in the design meeting, and we talked about how some design patterns might actually might be able to express them more directly by not having these weird singleton objects uh, that are really just there to be passed around and having method called methods called upon. It's a little, yeah. I, it, I, just another tool in your toolbox for when yeah. you try to rate the concern. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm going to share some of my experimentation as well, but I'm going to try it out. You know, I, I really mm -hmm. love the language. I like, like to play around with it. One last thing you want to say to a new generation of software engineers, Matt. What's your advice? You know, what, how do you, what do you, what do you tell to your younger self? I don't know. The one I want to, <laughs> there you go again. The one I, <laughs> I guess the one I think about right now, it'd be, a, it would be another thing in another day, you know, yes. it's human first. You are a human first. Yeah. Yeah. And the more that the more of your life that can be true in the better, you are always going to be better served. by being human first, yeah. by focusing on empathy, respect, relationships, diversity, inclusion, all those things. People over process, people over profit, people over, you know, yeah. operations. Than, gotcha. than any anything else. Um, that, just keep that in mind. Um, if you, it, and it's not even just I mean, it's probably smart career-wise as well, but mm -hmm. that's not the point. The point is you'll, you'll burn <laughs> you out. as an individual. Yeah, your yeah. environment is not is not conducive to that. At least my experience is that'll that'll burn you out real quick, and all the other things very quickly stop mattering. No matter how many patents you have, or or awards, or right. how many yeah. followers you have, or in various places and so on, um, may find safe spaces to be a human and to and make the human experience part of of your work life as much as you can that is that is key and it's, it's easy to forget especially when you're early in career and you yeah, feel yeah. like there's so much competition and so on they you know yeah you 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 have this fear you won't make it they all have that fear as well yeah everyone, has yeah. That. Um, everyone oh i'm not gonna make it but yeah take a deep breath and be a human I love that. I love that. Mads, you are very widely loved and appreciated. The work that you do, you know, changes the world. You know, every single decision you make, every single, you know, you know, a meeting you have with your team and you drive certain features, it makes someone else's life better somewhere. Maybe you are helping people. Maybe you will never meet millions and millions of engineers around the world. And I wanted to be someone to communicate that message to you. I really appreciate you as a human being. I appreciate you as an engineer and I appreciate you as an innovator. And I'm very honored to have this uh, little discussion with you today, sir. It's always a pleasure to hang out with you. And uh, I look forward to talking to you again sometime soon. And, uh, you know, for the people watching us, Maz Torgerson, everybody, I don't know how to say his last name in Danish, <laughs> but, but I do love the guy. And <laughs> for people watching us, of course, if you have any comments, questions, or concerns, or compliments for Mads, please feel free to drop a comment in the comment section. And don't forget to like and subscribe. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you, Mads. Have a good day. Thanks. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye.